All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Claire de la Calle, PGY5 at UCSF. Uh, we are very happy today to have Dr. Brannigan from Northwestern to talk to us about testosterone deficiency. Hello. Hello. Well, thank you very much, Claire. And I just want to thank the organizers for the opportunity to chat today. Uh, one unusual set of circumstances for all of us to be in, but I think what's inspiring is to see that resident education continues on. And I just want to say that I'm inspired by the mnemonic, the COVID mnemonic. So uh, congrats to whoever spent hours coming up with, uh, with that mnemonic. It works out pretty well, the Urology Collaborative Online Video Didactics. So I do have a few disclosures, a couple of disclosures. I serve as an editorial editor for Fertility and Sterility, and I'm on the exam committee for the American Board of Urology. So, you know, if we look on the internet and look at the word testosterone, it's pretty interesting to see what comes up on an internet search. Um, you know, we find a lot of sort of mom and pop type organizations that have come up with their own remedies, their home remedies or guides to treating low testosterone. This is a book by Dr. Schwartz and colleague. Uh, if we enter testosterone on the internet also or on social media, we find images that we see are this gentleman doing the before and after selfie. His normal testosterone level, again, that's not low testosterone, it's normal testosterone. And then when he goes up by 250%, he's looking a bit more uh, ripped and shredded. Um, there are a number of supplements out there um, that claim to increase lean muscle mass, to boost free and total testosterone and support stronger sex drive. But keep in mind that you know, a lot of these supplements are really not, not carefully tested or vetted and the claims that they make may actually not be based in any data. Uh, you know, if you do, again, the internet search for testosterone, we find a lot of articles, even in the New York Times, looking at the highs and lows of testosterone. Uh, the lower right-hand corner here is an interesting story. Uh, of course, we're all familiar with hearing stories about athletes doping, football, player, uh, football players, track athletes. But even about a year ago in the world of bridge, competitive bridge, uh, we find that testing for illegal substances revealed uh, illegal androgenic agents in a bridge player. Who, who would have thought that a bridge player would get some edge by taking supplemental uh, androgenic agents uh, prior to the big tournament? But, you know, I think at the lower uh, middle part of the screen, I think this is really this image from Time Magazine really captures a lot of what people think about in that split second when they think about testosterone therapy. So, um, you know, this image was from the cover of Time Magazine from 2000, and this is just after I become an attending physician, and these testosterone agents were becoming available in a gel form. And I think that this image captures what a lot of people, unfortunately, think about testosterone. You know, on the cover of the magazine, it talks about restoring sex drive, um, boosting muscle mass, uh, but it can also be dangerous. Is the edge worth it? And we see this guy here, a very, again, muscular, uh, snarling, growling with fists clenched in a very aggressive pose. And I think all these images collectively, unfortunately, are what a lot of people think of when they think about testosterone, or simply they just think about the sexual side of it. When I think about testosterone, though, I think about something very different. I, I think about this image, and some of you are probably familiar with this, this is the Vitruvian man, this image uh, put out by Leonardo da Vinci. And it just shows a man sort of in different, uh, different poses here, but a man in balance, in balance with himself. And I think about testosterone in this light because testosterone affects so many systems throughout the body, not just erections and libido, but it does affect muscle mass, the skin, the blood, uh, some, some aspects of cognition or mood. And so I think, I think of this when um, I'm thinking about testosterone. So, you know, if we're taking a step back, we all realize that the hypothalamus secretes GnRH, and that drives the anterior pituitary gland to produce LH, which then acts on the testicle to secrete testosterone from the Leydig cells. And that testosterone has paracrine effects locally within the, within the testicle. So we have the Leydig cells here and the testosterone in a paracrine fashion crosses over into the seminiferous tubules and acts on the Sertoli cells and supports sperm production. So there are paracrine effects, but then there are also endocrine effects, right? So we have this group of Leydig cells and the testosterone is you know, available in this local environment and picked up by these blood vessels, these capillaries, 
and transported, uh, I should say small blood vessels, in, including capillaries, and transported to the rest of the body where they exert a number of endocrine effects. It's important to know that there is a cyclical nature to testosterone secretion. Um, early in life in the fetal and neonatal periods, there are spikes of testosterone. Then also uh, in puberty, there's also an uptick in uh, testosterone levels. And then a gradual decline as men go through life. There's also a daily cycle of testosterone secretion with peak levels occurring in the morning and then levels drifting down over the course of the day. And we're gonna talk about that. That's an important concept of measuring testosterone. So these testosterone guidelines were published about two years ago. Why were they published? Why did we need them? Well, we really did need them. We know that testosterone prescriptions have tripled in, in recent years with the availability of all these agents and with the marketing. And while many men are using testosterone without a clear indication, I'm sorry, there are many men using testosterone without a clear indication. In fact, 25% of men on testosterone therapy have never even had a testosterone level measured. 40% uh, of men on testosterone therapy have no follow-up labs performed, and this is an error. This is a medical error to not track men over time. About one-third of patients on testosterone therapy do not meet the criteria, the diagnostic criteria to treat. And it's also the fact that there are a lot of guys out there with low testosterone who may be in need of therapy or simply not receiving it. We also know that there's been a proliferation of anti-aging and low testosterone centers over the years. And the fact is that um, you know, some of these centers are just not structured or just not run to provide the sort of comprehensive, proper care that the patients on this therapy with this condition need. So simply stated, we were indeed in need of guidance, and, and that's why these guidelines were produced. A multidisciplinary panel was created to write them, and the aim was to inform clinicians, number one, on the proper assessment of patients with testosterone deficiency, and also the safe and effective management of men on testosterone therapy. Now, there are also additional statements to address the care of men with or at risk for cardiovascular disease and prostate cancer, and also the care of men interested in preserving their fertility. And this document was published in the Journal of Urology back in August of 2018. That was also published on the AUA website at that time. Uh, the panel was chaired and run by John Mulhall and co-chaired by Ron Lewis, who did a wonderful job, I think, uh, handling this issue, and a number of urologists, epidemiologists, uh, and, and other specialists. Uh, and I just wanna thank, uh, together, uh, this parts of this talk, parts of the content, um, I worked on with uh, John Mulhall, Emily Kurtz, and, and Landon Trost. Uh, together, uh, we put together these slides for, uh, some of these slides for an AUA presentation. So today, my um, aim is not to cover the entire document. There's not enough time to do that. So therefore, I'm going to focus on the diagnosis of low testosterone and testosterone deficiency, and then address some challenging patient scenarios in a case-based format in a way to highlight the cardiovascular statements and also those fertility statements. And then we'll close with a brief discussion about prostate statements. So first up, the defi definition of low testosterone. So what did the guidelines say? Well, clinicians should use a total testosterone level less than 300 nanograms per deciliter as a reasonable cutoff in support of the diagnosis of low testosterone. Where did this number come from? Well, a series of RCTs of testosterone therapy used a cutoff of total T of 350 for inclusion criteria. And if we look at those same studies, the median baseline total level was 249. So that's where that 300 level came from. And historically, that traditionally has been a level that other societies or other professional organizations have used as a cutoff. Uh, the panel does not recommend using free testosterone as a primary measure of diagnosing testosterone deficiency. Why is that? Well, free testosterone is a high coefficient of variation. There are really no well-defined cutoffs for free testosterone in the literature. And frankly, most of the epidemiological literature has really used total testosterone. Well, uh, what about testosterone measurement? The diagnosis of low testosterone should be made only after two total testosterone measures are taken on two separate occasions, and they should both uh, be done in an early morning time. Important again to keep in mind the circadian rhythm of testosterone secretion with peak levels occurring between 3 a.m. and 8 a.m. and then values drifting down. So if we look at a man in his 30 to 40 year old age range, we'll find that levels in the afternoon are often 20 to 25% lower than they are in the morning. Now this daily circadian rhythm is less uh, impactful in men who are older, only about 10% testosterone variation over the course of the day in most men uh, in the age of 70 uh, years old or older. 
It's also important to note that it's important to get two measures because of the intra-individual variability. Even if the same lab is used, the same assay, there's a pretty a wide degree of variation in results. And therefore, we want to check two or three measures of testosterone. There's been some talk about patients needing to be NPO before measuring, but there's really not strong literature supporting that. Food has a weak effect on serum testosterone levels. And also, um, you know, we want to keep in mind, we don't want to test testosterone when someone has an acute illness. Uh, acute illness uh, can lead to a transient decline in levels. So we want to wait until they're recovered before checking testosterone levels. And what about diagnosing the clinical condition of testosterone deficiency? Well, this diagnosis is only made when the patient has low total testosterone levels combined with symptoms and or signs. And it's important to keep in mind that many of the symptoms are nonspecific and might be related to other conditions than low testosterone. So some of the symptoms of low testosterone may actually be due not to low T, but rather to chronic stress, chronic fatigue, depression, or other medical issues. Also, the diagnosis of testosterone deficiency, really, uh, it's important to do a physical exam. We want to assess for general body habitus, evidence of decreased virilization, evidence of increased BMI, evidence of gynecomastia, evidence of decreased testicular size or soft testicles. We want to look for the presence of a varicocele and also consider, in, um, in, especially in, in, in aging men, prostate size and morphology. So these are some of the common uh, signs and symptoms of testosterone uh, deficiency. I'm not gonna go through these, I think you all know these, but really there's a big cluster of, of signs and symptoms that go along with this condition. There are some high risk groups that's important to talk about, and you, you need to know about this point. Clinicians should consider measuring total testosterone in patients with a history of unexplained anemia, bone density loss, diabetes, exposure to chemotherapy, exposure to testicular radiation, HIV AIDS, chronic narcotic use, male infertility, pituitary dysfunction, and chronic corticosteroid use. Why is this? Why do we need to check these men? Well, even in the absence of signs or symptoms, there's a high prevalence of testosterone deficiency seen in these patients. And um, just due to the effects of low testosterone um, more broadly, Checking a level in these men is recommended. <clears throat> so uh, what about therapeutic target ranges for testosterone? So once we're actually starting treatment, clinicians should adjust the testosterone therapy dosing to achieve a total level in the middle third or the middle tertile of the normal reference range. And so the panel recommended really aiming for that range of 450 to 600. And if we look at 31 randomized trials demonstrating the benefits of testosterone therapy, the median post-treatment total testosterone levels in these men were 490 to 670. So we want to aim for that, that level once we're treating men. There are a number of testosterone therapeutic options available. I'm not going to go through these in detail, but you know, just to mention lifestyle modification, topical gels and patches, short-acting injectable agents, testosterone pellets, there's an oral buckle patch, intranasal gel. There's some other alternative medical strategies that we'll dive into in just a few minutes. And then a newer agent, an oral testosterone agent, that it's important to note that with this agent, this is uh, to be used really only in patients with uh, low testosterone due to genetic conditions such as Klinefelter syndrome. And the FDA recommends against using it in men with age-related low testosterone. So what symptom improvement might a patient expect after they start uh, testosterone therapy? Well, the data would suggest that patients should uh, expect perhaps to have improvement in erectile function, low sex drive, anemia, uh, low, ben low bone mineral density, um, uh, issues with lean body mass, and depressive symptoms. The literature is less clear or the, letter the data is less conclusive about whether testosterone therapy improves cognitive function, measures of diabetes, energy levels, fatigue, lipid measures, and quality of life measures. Let's talk now a little bit about testosterone and cardiovascular disease risk, and we're going to frame this in the context of a case. So we have a 50-year-old white male who presents with a 12-month history of decreased energy, depression and irritability, and low libido. In terms of medical history, it's a history of hypertension, dyslipidemia, and metabolic syndrome. He's married, he's a banker, he doesn't smoke, and he drinks less than one alcoholic beverage a day. 
Now, his family history is notable for uh, premature cardiovascular disease in his father, who had an MI at age 53. Uh, an additional review of symptoms, he has poor sleep habits. He often works late, gets often less than six hours of sleep at night, but he has no chest pain, shortness of breath, or other anginal symptoms. Now, when we move on to his physical exam, we find he's hypertensive. He's got a BP of 140 over 95. His weight is 240. His BMI and waist circumference are both elevated. And so he's obese and he's got predominant central adiposity. However, he has no gynecomastia and no testicular or prostate abnormalities. His baseline labs show a normal H and H, but his early morning total testosterone was low at 240, and that came back low again on the repeat. His fasting lipid profile shows numerous abnormalities, including an elevated total cholesterol, elevated LDL and triglycerides, and a low HDL. However, his PSA, LA, gestradiol, and prolactin all came back within normal limits. So what's the next step for this patient with regard to managing his low testosterone? Well, the guidelines state, and this is an important concept, that patients should be advised of therapeutic lifestyle strategies as a first step to improve their testosterone levels. And these therapeutic changes include initiating an aerobic exercise program of at least 150 minutes a week, weight loss targeting to a BMI level less than 25, and improving sleep hygiene with regular bedtime and aiming for seven to eight hours of sleep at night. All of these measures have been shown to improve testosterone levels. And perhaps even more importantly, these measures may improve overall health, right? So these are things to talk about upfront at the time low testosterone is diagnosed. Now these can be challenging for patients to engage with and to be compliant with, and also they take time. Now this patient was compliant, and six months later he came back and his blood pressure was improved, he dropped 20 pounds, and both his BMI and waist circumference were improved also. His uh, laboratory data showed normalization of his cholesterol, LDL, triglycerides, and HDL, and his total testosterone did rise up to 280, but it was still low. In fact, he noted that while he had some symptomatic improvement, he was still bothered by decreased energy, depression, and irritability, and low libido. So then what's the next step for him? Well, we wanna consider starting testosterone therapy. But first, really important point, at this point in the care of the patient, it's important to take a minute and inform the patient that low testosterone is a risk factor for cardiovascular disease. In fact, ideally this conversation happens at the time of low testosterone diagnosis. So what, what do we mean by this? We mean that low testosterone levels in and of themselves, even before any treatment, is associated with an increased incidence of major adverse cardiac events or MESAs, such as MI, stroke, and even possibly cardiovascular related mortality. And you can see the odds ratios there at the bottom of the slide for MI 1.33, for stroke 1.41, and the relative risk for death from cardiac causes 1.25. Also, it's important to counsel the patient that low testosterone levels are also associated with an increased prevalence of certain, certain atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease risk factors, including hypertension, dyslipidemia, increased BMI, and obesity. And again, we see the odds ratios there for hypertension, 1.59, dyslipidemia, 1.34, obesity 1.94 and increased BMI 1.97. So, you know, we should assess all testosterone deficient patients for these risk factors, both fixed, in his case that would include older age and male sex, but then modifiable risk factors, hypertension, dyslipidemia, obesity, diabetes, current cigarette smoking, because these are modifiable. And again, his overall health, we need to keep that in mind as we're treating this condition. And and counsel him, or at least get him in the hands of a primary care physician or a cardiologist who can help to manage these issues. So um, it's important also prior to initiating treatment that the clinician counsels the patient that at this time, it cannot be definitively stated whether testosterone therapy increases or decreases the risk of cardiovascular events. So in other words, a patient who's got low T who goes on testosterone therapy, does that help or hurt his risk of subsequent cardiovascular events. And the bottom line is that the studies to date measuring cardiovascular benefit and harm have been inconsistent with controversial results. Um, and so we really can't say what effect testosterone therapy has at this point based on the data. But again, to restate the earlier point, current evidence does consistently show that untreated low testosterone levels are associated with an increased risk of major adverse cardiac events. So if we take a, a step at, at uh, testosterone therapy and incidence of MACE, 
we find that randomized controlled trials really um, don't show evidence of increase in MI, stroke, uh, cardiovascular death, or, or all-cause mortality. But there are uh, you know, numerous epidemiological observational studies and meta-analyses that weigh in on this topic as well. And they just show a very heterogeneous result. Some show an increase in adverse events, others a decrease, and others a neutral effect. So really, the, the jury is still out on this one. And therefore, until there's definitive evidence proving an association between testosterone therapy and subsequent MACE, the panel recommends that clinicians counsel patients that the current literature does not definitively demonstrate that testosterone therapy increases the risk of major adverse cardiac events. Um, with that in mind, though, it's important that patients who are on testosterone therapy uh, be reminded if they develop any of these issues, chest pain, shortness of breath, dizziness, that obviously, you know, they get in touch with uh, their urologist and really, you know, involve their primary care doctor primarily uh, and internist or cardiologist as well uh, to address these issues. So this gentleman starts testosterone therapy and comes back six months later, and he's noted improvement in his low sex drive, improvement in lean body mass concerns, uh, improvement in his energy level and his depressive symptoms. And if we look at his visceral fat, lipid profile, and fasting blood glucose, in him, all those is, have continued to improve as he's maintained these lifestyle inter interventions of exercise and weight loss and also concurrent medical management. His weight has dropped down to 200, both BMI and waist circumference have gone in the right direction. And if we look at where he's at with his total testosterone levels, they are you know, at a good range at 750 on therapy. However, we know that when someone's on testosterone therapy, we need to track hemoglobin and hematocrit every six months. And for him, um, he is shown to have you know, an elevated hematocrit of 54. And you know, we're always on the lookout for that. So what's the next step in the management of his testosterone? Well, you know, two things. Number one, we want to drop the dosage of his testosterone to address the polycythemia. And also, if the level of polycythemia is concerning enough, we want to consider therapeutic phlebotomy for this patient, which uh, obviously is a more uh, rapid approach to uh, taking care of an elevated hematocrit level. So again, important at baseline part offering testosterone therapy, clinicians should measure a baseline h and &H level and inform patients of this increased risk of polycythemia on therapy. Now again, this is a concern at some of these centers and, and some clinicians prescribing testosterone without following patients over time for this very issue. Now, it's important to note that to date, the data and the literature examining the relationship between testosterone therapy and the incidence of venothrombolic events has returned conflicting results. And patients should be informed that at this point, there's no definitive evidence linking testosterone therapy to a higher incidence of venothrombolic events, but obviously we want to keep patients out of that high hematocrit level uh, and, and, and avoid that potential issue. So this gentleman does well, and 10 years later, he's 60 and he comes back and he's developed unstable angina and ultimately has a coronary angiogram that reveals single vessel disease and he requires a single stent be placed. What now? He's on testosterone therapy. What do we do uh, regarding the administration of testosterone at this point? And so what the guidelines state is this, is hold testosterone for three to six months after a cardiovascular event. Um, at this point in time, there's not enough evidence to offer clear guidance on the use of testosterone in men who have existing stable ASCVD or a remote history of MI or CVA, but the panel felt collectively that testosterone therapy with close monitoring and safety surveillance could be considered in these patients, in particular if there's been at least a three to six month window after the cardiovascular event. And of course, we follow these patients with regular visits over time. So what are the key points with uh, low testosterone and cardiovascular risks? Well, number one, low testosterone as a disease state, even at, before any testosterone therapy has been given, is a risk factor for cardiovascular events. Two, therapeutic lifestyle interventions should be recommended as an initial treatment for low testosterone, and those interventions may not only improve testosterone, but also overall health of the patient. Three, the cardiovascular risks and benefits of testosterone therapy and men with symptomatic low testosterone remain uncertain. So how does testosterone affect cardiovascular risk? How does that therapy affect risk? We just don't know at this point in time. In terms of venothrombolic risk, there's no clear evidence of increased risk on testosterone therapy, uh, but polycythemia should be avoided. And finally, there's just not enough evidence currently 
to support a guideline for testosterone treatment of men with recent cardiovascular events. But for now, um, you know, the, the guideline panel felt that using criteria that most of the RCTs use was, uh, was, was, um, was a good idea. And that would be to wait three to six months after a cardiovascular event before um, starting or resuming testosterone placement therapy. Let's talk now about testosterone and male fertility, a topic near and dear to my heart. So we have a 26 year old white male who presents with many years of low sex drive, uh, poor response to working out, um, and increased central adiposity. He wonders if he should have his testosterone level checked. He has no prior medical or surgical history. He's not on any medications. Uh, he is newly married, he's a consultant. He doesn't smoke and he does not drink alcohol. On exam, he is six foot three, 190 pounds. He has no gynecomastia, but both testicles are atrophic with volumes of six milliliters. And his vas deferens, epididymides, uh, both are normal to palpation, and he has no varicoceles. So you send off the testosterone level on him, and the testosterone comes back at 200 nanograms per deciliter, which is low. And right away, you know, you notify him of the results, and he asks, can I start gel therapy? I, you know, I've done my homework on this. I really think I would benefit. But what is the next step in managing his low testosterone? Well, the next step is obviously to repeat a testosterone level, but also to send off a serum LH level. Why is that? Well, measuring LH can help uh, facilitate clinicians to establish the etiology of testosterone deficiency um, and see if LH deficiency is present, um, as this may be an important factor in determining if adjunctive tests are needed. And this is detailed in table two from the guidelines. And so he has the repeat testosterone level and also the serum LH level. The LH level comes back low, indicating hypogonadotropic hypogonadism. Now, when you're reviewing these results with him, he also throws out there that he and his wife are going to begin trying to conceive in about six months. So we know from the guidelines that for patients who are interested in preserving their fertility or interested in current fertility, an FSH level should also be sent off. And perhaps not surprisingly, his FSH level also comes back low. So he does have full-blown hypogonadotropic hypogonadism, and he's gonna begin efforts to conceive in six months. So what are the next steps? Well, the guidelines state for men with testosterone deficiency interested in future fertility, that a reproductive health evaluation be a part of this workup. And so for this guy, we'd be taking reproductive history, you know, a good reproductive exam, but then also offering semen analysis testing. And he goes for two semen tests and they come back revealing normal ejaculate volume azospermia on both. So then what is the management of this gentleman as low testosterone? Um, can we honor his request? He wants to go on testosterone gel. He knows how easy that is to use and he's got friends on it and he wants to pursue it. Well, exogenous testosterone is actually the last thing that we wanna give this particular patient. Uh, the guidelines state clearly that exogenous testosterone therapy should not be prescribed to men who are currently trying to conceive. Why is that? Well, exogenous testosterone has inhibitory effects on the production of intratesticular testosterone, and those normal intratesticular testosterone levels are imperative to maintain spermatogenesis. So exogenous testosterone suppresses intratesticular testosterone production, and in terms of sperm production, can lead to super oligospermia or azospermia. I can't tell you the number of times that we see this in our field where a well-intentioned physician sees a man with low testosterone, puts him on testosterone therapy, and the end result is they come into our office azospermic and wondering what, what's going on. So how do we manage low testosterone in these patients? Well, clinicians can use aromatase inhibitors, human chorionic gonadotropin, uh, selective estrogen receptor modulators, either alone or in combination and men with testosterone deficiency in order to help maintain their fertility. And so while these all share the common overall treatment effect, namely increasing um, endogenous testosterone production, there are differences in the pharmacological considerations and in their mode of action. And so that's actually a nice thing because we can sometimes use these agents together in combination to help drive intrinsic testosterone production in these patients. Let's talk a little bit about the three groups of agents. There are aromatase inhibitors, these block the conversion of testosterone to estradiol, and the net increase in testosterone levels that AIs cause is due, number one, to the decreased conversion of testosterone to estradiol, but then secondarily, the lower estradiol levels lead to lower negative feedback 
uh, of estradiol to the pituitary gland and it's estradiol that suppresses LH secretion. So with AI, uh, AI's uh, LH production goes up and that further promotes testosterone production. Second agent is human chorionic gonadotropin. Now this is an injectable agent, typically given three times a week. It is a direct LH agonist and directly stimulates lytic cells to make testosterone. Third, selective estrogen receptor modulators or SERMs. These block pituitary estradiol feed, uh, feedback, block those receptors, and uh, by blocking those receptors, uh, block the negative feedback at the pituitary gland, and that results in LH secretion increases for the driving testosterone. So after a discussion, he elects to start HCG, and three months uh, on HCG, his total testosterone level normalized to 500, um, and his testosterone deficiency symptoms, that low libido, low muscle mass, improve. He has repeat semen testing at three and six months, and lo and behold, he now has sperm in the ejaculate. His sperm concentrations are in the normal range, albeit at the lower end of normal, which is common for guys with hypogonadic, tropic hypogonadism, but his numbers actually look quite good overall. And so the couple begins timed intercourse using an ovulation detection kit, and they conceived successfully by natural means nine months after he started the HCG, and they had a healthy son born at term. So what are some of the key points regarding uh, testosterone and, and, and infertility or fertility? Number one, men with testosterone deficiency who are interested in fertility should have a reproductive health evaluation performed prior to testosterone therapy. Two, serum LH levels can help to establish the etiology of testosterone deficiency and determine if adjunctive tests are needed. Three, adjunctive testing, including FSH, estradiol, and karyotype, should be ordered in special cases of men with testosterone deficiency. So for example, a man interested in future fertility should have an FSH level measured. A man with gynecomastia at the time of workup should have an estradiol level check. A man with unexplained hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, in other words, he's got elevated FSH, elevated LH, but low testosterone, that man should undergo a karyotype test. Why is that? Well, we know the prevalence of Klinefelter syndrome is about one in 650, and this is gonna be a uh, you know, key way to diagnose these patients with a karyotype, and uh, very often they'll present in this fashion with low testosterone. The fourth take-home point, exogenous testosterone therapy should not be prescribed to men who are currently trying to conceive. This is actually exogenous testosterone as a contraceptive agent. And you know, there are studies going on around the world looking at exogenous testosterone in different formulations um, as a contraceptive agent, so wanna avoid that. What about alternative therapies? Well, aromatase inhibitors, HCG, and SERMs can be used. And in some instances, these are used in an off-label fashion in men who are desiring to maintain their fertility. And finally, the long-term long impact of exogenous testosterone and spermatogenesis should be discussed with patients who are interested in future fertility. Now, there's evidence that over time, over years, uh, patients can develop testicular atrophy, and some men can develop you know, suppression of spermatogenesis that may persist um, out even years in, a, after cessation of testosterone therapy and, and be even a permanent condition. So, Let's pivot now and talk about testosterone in the prostate gland. And you know, there's less that we can state definitively about this issue. Uh, there are some statements that we can make in review, but quite frankly, there's a lot that's unknown. So just as background, obviously we've got the HPG axis here on the left side. Uh, we know that the hypothalamus drives testosterone production in the testicles, but it's really both, you know, Androgens from not only the testicle, but also the adrenal gland that act on the prostate gland that drives stromal cell and epithelial cell proliferation. So testosterone supports the normal development of the prostate gland um, really throughout a man's life. And um, we also know about links of testosterone to prostate cancer. This is a classic article for, from 1941 by Huggins and Hodge, Hodges in patients with metastatic prostate cancer who underwent orchiectomy, so their, their testicles were removed and they had improvement or regression in their metastatic prostate cancer to some degree. So we know there are links there between uh, the prostate gland and testosterone. But what about this? Is low testosterone a risk factor for having prostate cancer? There have been a number of studies that have looked at the relationship. Um, Dr. Morgenthaler has done a couple of studies on this, but a, a number of other authors have too, and suggested that men with low testosterone have a higher risk of prostate cancer. I would say in the guidelines, you know, there's a very formal way to look at data and decide what data 
um, you know, is, um, is suitable for inclusion, which doesn't meet criteria, that the studies that, were, that met inclusion criteria and were incorporated did not show an association between low testosterone and prostate cancer. We'll see what happens as we go through time with additional studies, but that's the current statement. What about testosterone therapy and the risk of developing prostate cancer? So, of course, it's not surprising uh, that men who have low testosterone, when their testosterone levels are, are supplemented, there is an increase in PSA level seen. But if you look at studies, what hap tends to happen is the PSA level tends to go back to the level of peers who have normal, uh, normal testosterone levels. And based on the guidelines since this document, there is no increased risk of elevated PSA for men on testosterone therapy. And what about the risk of de novo prostate cancer? You know, the guideline statement, the analysis did not show an increased risk of prostate cancer, de novo prostate cancer for men on therapy. So what statements can we make? Well, first of all, clinicians should inform patients of the absence of evidence linking testosterone therapy to the development of prostate cancer. That's what the data shows at this time. So how should we care for our patients? Well, you know, we know that the AUA guideline on the early detection of prostate cancer talks about, you know, screening and recommending against screening uh, of men in that 40 to 50 year old age range toward average risk, but then thinking about men with high risk features doing screening in them. So based on race or family history, really no comment on testosterone and how that figures into the early detection of prostate cancer. But from the testosterone deficiency guidelines, uh, the panel recommended that PSA be measured in men over 40 prior to the commencement of therapy to exclude at that baseline a prostate cancer diagnosis and also to provide a baseline PSA level moving forward since that's gonna be tracked over time. What about testosterone therapy in men with in situ or treated prostate cancer? You know, there are a number of studies out there showing that men with untreated prostate cancer and men with prostate cancer treated by different modalities, you know, have been on testosterone therapy uh, and uh, been done so uh, with success or safety. But, you know, there are issues with these studies and the guidelines panel, you know, recognize that there are just significant issues with methodology and power of these studies. And really, you know, broader studies are needed before a guidelines level statement could be made. And therefore, the, the panel recommended that patients with testosterone def deficiency um, and a history of prostate cancer should be informed that there's inadequate evidence at this time to quantify the risk-benefit ratio of testosterone therapy. So what are the takeaways with uh, testosterone and prostate cancer risk? Number one, a PSA level should be measured in men over 40 if they're going to start testosterone therapy to evaluate for prostate cancer. Two, no increased risk of uh, developing de novo prostate cancer has been seen with testosterone therapy. And third, it's unclear what the risk-benefit ratio is of men with either untreated or treated prostate cancer and starting testosterone therapy in these patients. So uh, I would encourage you to pick up this guidelines document and uh, become familiar with it. I think a lot of interesting points. Uh, you know, these patients are looking uh, to us for guidance and I think we want to provide them with the care they need, but do it in a thoughtful way that supports their overall health. And, you know, throughout this talk, we, we talked about cardiovascular risk to some extent and monitoring, monitoring some of these things. I think that the aim of the guidelines panel wasn't so much to have urologists act as internists or cardiologists, but just to have these discussions with the patients and make sure that they're engaging with a primary care physician or cardiologist who may be able to help partner with um, you know implementing some of these recommendations in the care of our patients and uh, so um, i think that's uh, going to wrap up the, the presentation i see there might be some questions so thank you very much i appreciate it thank you so much dr brannigan that was a great talk we have lots of questions to go through um, so we're going to start with uh, questions regarding uh, testosterone levels so someone asked if the circadian uh, rhythm of testosterone changes in patients that work night shifts? So the literature is a little bit divided on patients who work night shifts. I think that in the short term, you know, we see a lot, physicians, right? Emergency room physicians come to mind especially. I think we see in the short term less of that, but um, I think what the literature would show that over the long term for someone who's maybe 
on more of a long-term regular schedule, that that's where we're gonna see some of these uh, issues and, and some patients reset. But the person who's doing an occasional night shift or maybe a week of nights, not gonna tend to see the, the flip there as readily in most of those patients. Okay, um, also in the testosterone levels um, uh, realm, uh, is there ever a role for checking sex hormone binding globulin for patients with low T? Yeah, so, you know, sex hormone binding globulin is, is interesting, right? So, um, you know, so it's a protein made in the liver, and the idea is that testosterone either is free in the serum or binds to albumin, and albumin is a, is a forgiving host, we'll say. It allows testosterone to sort of come and go and to bind with the receptor. Sex hormone binding globulin, um, you know, binds testosterone and it makes it unavailable for use by the receptor. So I think in men, you know, if we're worried that um, even though the total testosterone level uh, is normal, you're still worried that there may be a low testosterone issue. There is a place for measuring uh, sex hormone binding globulin, uh, and then you, you can calculate, you know, bioavailable testosterone using that and see if the patient is indeed low. But, but again, we don't want that to be the primary pathway for these patients. Uh, important to note that a patient with liver disease like hepatitis, you know, the production of sex hormone binding globulin actually goes up in those patients. And so those patients and some other patients with, with chronic liver disease may be the ones that we're thinking about in whom sex hormone binding globulin might be more of an issue clinically. Okay. Um, and for patients that have uh, baseline testosterones of 800 to 1,000 or high normal in the past and then um, become low, do they need to be recorrected to their original levels or, or back to the guidelines uh, of 400 to 600 range? I mean, this is such a great point, right? I mean, I think sometimes we see these patients, they come in literally with sheaves of, of paper and lab reports. Mm -hmm. And, you know, they used to be here, now they're here. And so... I think again, you know, the guidelines are pretty clear. Um, you know, we want to dial in the patient's response. Number one, we want to make sure that their levels are, are, are reaching the therapeutic range and, and try to get to that mid uh, tertile if we can. And then really dial up or down from there based on their symptomatic response. So if someone comes back on therapy, their level is 500 and they feel great, we would leave them there. And you know there are those patients who just recall higher levels and really you know feel fine, but feel like you know just out of principle they should be dialed at a higher level. And we really don't target like that. We don't target therapy like that. And there are a number of reasons why. Um, you know, is it going to, for example, increase the risk of adverse side effects, in, in, including uh, elevated hematocrit levels and other other potential side effects? We want, really want to dial to that mid third level and based on symptoms, not just treat to a number. Okay. I think on the front end, when we're starting to treat, have those discussions, just where we're coming from as clinicians on that matter. So are their expectations are set appropriately. Okay. What if the patient is symptomatic, but his testosterone levels are normal? How do you counsel those patients? Well, you yeah, so what if they're, they're symptomatic, but testosterone levels are normal? We see this a lot, right? I mean, I think if you look at this Adam questionnaire, it's one of the earlier questionnaires that it was even available, I think, when I was a resident. Um, we find that, and I pointed this out in one of the slides, the, the strong overlap between low testosterone and other conditions, and one of those conditions is depression. Uh, you know, one of the studies looking at the Adam questionnaire found that the overlap, and, and this actually, the study was done in doctors, found that the overlap between depressive symptoms and low testosterone symptoms was so profound, it was hard to tease those two conditions apart. So it may, may very well be the case that a man presents to the urologist with concerns or symptoms, but what actually is going on is clinical depression. And so we need to keep that in mind and keep other potential medical issues uh, in mind that may be the root cause of the problem and need to you know, help direct patients appropriately when we're finding that uh, low testosterone isn't, isn't looking like it's an issue when we do our workup. It's a great, really good point. Yeah. Um, and when you start patients on testosterone replacement therapy, how do you counsel them? Do you give them a number, um, a percent chance of how likely they are to actually see any benefits from the treatment? Yeah, so we, we typically bring the patients back at about, you know, two to four weeks after they start therapy for that initial visit. And we explain that it takes time. I, I think some people literally um, you know, think about some medicines they take in the instant response, and it doesn't happen overnight with testosterone. So I think, first of all, letting them know that we're going to check back in about a month or so, we would expect to see some benefit or improvement then. 
And if low testosterone is the issue, most of these men will have symptomatic improvement. But sometimes we'll see guys come back and it doesn't help. And, you know, I, you know, I'm grateful for that. I explain, look, this is good. Now we need to look for other issues, other causes of the symptoms that you're having. Okay. For men that are on finasteride or Propecia, um, how do you factor that into uh, your decision to start treatment and dosing? Yeah, so, you know, finasteride and, and th these sorts of agents, I, I think we're, you know, sort of uh, aware of them, um, but, you know, they're really not figuring in heavily to, you know, starting uh, dosages or follow-up or, or, or measures. I mean, we're, we're sort of aware of it, but um, it's, not a, it's not a big determinant in, in treatment decisions up front or longitudinally over time. Obviously, we keep in mind the, the effects on PSA, uh, but um, that would be the biggest, um, the biggest way that it's impacting our decision making. Okay. Um, a, f a few of the viewers wanted to know if you could discuss what your starting dose is for testosterone and just the different types of forms of testosterone that you like prescribing. Great. So I th think for, you know, testosterone gels, uh, commonly the most common commercial brands, um, you know, the dose, starting doses are actually all, all over the place for these. And I think, um, you know, it may not be so helpful to run through, but just to take a stab at it. So intramuscular testosterone, which a lot of, um, you know, a lot of patients are on these days just due to cost issues and insurance issues, commonly will do uh, either 100 milligrams a week, 200 milligrams every two weeks, or 300 milligrams every three weeks. Uh, obviously, the shorter the dosing interval, the less the peaks and the troughs with uh, intramuscular testosterone therapy. For the topical gels, the most commonly available one that's out there, it's two pumps a day in the morning after the patient showers. I want to make sure they put it on before they shower. Uh, you know, there's an underarm application as well with similar sort of, um, you know, application strategy. Um, the testosterone pellets, the commonly used pellet, will start commonly at about 10 of these pellets. I'm trying to avoid using brand names here, which I, I think we, we don't need to use brand names at all, but uh, 10 uh, of, the, of, the of the pellets that go in the upper outer quadrant of the buttock. Um, you know, there is a, a patch that, you know, goes in the mouth that um, isn't gained a lot of traction, but that's a twice a day application. And then there's an intranasal formulation that uh, the dosing uh, of that, it's a gel, an intranasal gels three times a day. Great, and someone wanted to know, why would you hold the testosterone uh, replacement therapy in a patient that you're just normalizing his levels in a case of an MI, for instance? Uh, wouldn't the lower testosterone levels further increase his risk? That's a great question, right? I mean, the problem is it was just really the guidelines panel and coming up with that recommendation it really came from two places. Number one, an abundance of caution. And number two is, you know, when you're on a guidelines panel, what you're doing largely is looking at the existing body of literature and looking at the methodology of studies from which that literature was derived. And that three to six month window was a pretty uniform approach used in those studies, again, out of an abundance of caution. And obviously every one of those studies uh, had a lot of thought and um, care uh, uh, you know, put forth in their design and execution. And really that's where we came from. In terms of stopping testosterone in a man who's already had a cardiovascular event, are we further increasing the risk? I, I guess it's hard to know uh, with, with certainty what, what we're doing. As we said, we don't know with testosterone therapy if we're helping or hurting. So the panel just thought with all this data under consideration, out of an abundance of caution, stopping for three to six months made sense. It's a, it's a, it's a great point. Yeah. Um, for patients that have been on testosterone replacement therapy for years with stable symptoms, um, if they stop tr their treatment, uh, do they go back to square one from a symptom standpoint? Um, and do you keep these patients on their treatment indefinitely? Yeah, so, you know, we talk about this really, you know, in most instances, there's not a cure for low testosterone. Now, if someone has done aggressive lifestyle changes and they go into the normal range, that's a cure. If someone has a prolactinoma and that's treated, that's a cure. But for most of our patients, there's really not a cure. There's treatment options. And so these treatments, you know, once the treatment is stopped, I think of it as being like a blood pressure medicine, 
the patient goes back down to where they typically goes down to where they started or lower. Keep in mind, these patients have increased in age over the course of the time of their treatment. So their production may actually be further, uh, further impeded. And so, you know, I think for these patients, um, it's, it's hard to know where they'll wind up, but occasionally we see someone who goes on a trip and they forgot their medicine or they didn't take it. They come back a week or two later and they say, you know, I think I'm okay, maybe I don't need it. And you know, we'll follow those patients closely. And my approach with those patients is this, if, if you feel fine off therapy, stop it. You know, let, let's not have you on it. We'll check levels again and see where they are. Um, if they're still low, then we'll have a thoughtful discussion about the pros and cons of them going back on treatment. But again, remember, we're not treating just numbers. We're also treating symptoms. And the vast majority of those, these patients, except for that one group that we talked about, the patients with special considerations, and those patients will consider measuring, um, you know, despite the presence or absence of symptoms. Um, and for patients that have polycythemia, uh, for how long do you stop testosterone? When do you recheck labs? Do you um, refer, and when do you refer uh, to hematology? Yeah, so, you know, I mean, we see a lot of this, and I think that we're pretty comfortable managing it, but we, we do involve the internists. I mean, they, they need to know what's going on uh, with these patients. Um, you know, I think someone who has concerning levels, if we're worried that something else might be going on, driving the polycythemia, then we'll involve, uh, you know, a hematologist. You know, if the levels are really high, we'll pull the, you know, we'll, we'll initiate uh, the trigger um, and do a therapeutic phlebotomy to get the levels down. That's going to be the quickest way. But if we someone's starting to trend up, but not quite at a concerning level, then maybe just lowering the dosage can be a way to kind of avert, you know, concerning levels of polycythemia and avoid a trip to, to have that blood drawn off. Okay. Um, someone wanted to know if there were any major differences between AUA and EAU guidelines uh, for testosterone replacement therapy. You no, know, there, there, there are some. I think that the, in the broad strokes, though, the guidelines tend to be pretty, pretty similar. Um, you know, I mean, I, th I think it really comes down to, to nuances uh, and difference. And historically, you know, the Endocrine Society also has guidelines out there. Um, you know, I, I, for this purposes of this talk, I, I think for, you know, um, for, for uh, residents, I think, you know, you should be familiar with, you know, with those uh, European guidelines. But I think, um, you know, really, uh, you know, from an AUA core curriculum perspective, I think a lot of the core curriculum and so forth is, is built off of um, the, the AUA guidelines. It doesn't mean the European guidelines are wrong or, or insufficient, but I think, you know, for your purpose, I, I think really being familiar with both, but really being familiar with the AUA guidelines is going to be key. Okay. Um, uh, someone uh, mentioned that uh, testosterone can sometimes not be reimbursed by insurance. Is this something that you've had I issues with in your practice? Oh my goodness. Yes. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, yeah. It, it's, it's really, it's amazing the, the insurance issues with testosterone therapy. Um, you know, we'll have patients who go along, been on it for years, and every year they have to come off treatment, stop treatment to prove that their testosterone level is still low. Um, you know, we don't do this with insulin management. We don't see this with blood pressure management, but it's common for insurance companies to make patients at the beginning of every calendar year stop treatment, demonstrate on two separate blood tests that their testosterone level is low, and then they'll approve therapy. So we see this a lot, and, and there's really been you know, a tightening of the belt with a lot of insurance plans not even covering therapy at all. Um, and so for that reason, if patients are paying out of pocket, you know, very commonly we'll go with the injection approach, which, you know, is, is very well tolerated by patients. Um, you know, there is, a, you know, probably it's going to be the most cost effective in terms of out of pocket cost for the patient and generally pretty well tolerated. And you know, while there's an increased risk of polycythemia with the injectable form, one of the nice things that we don't have to worry about that is transference, right? You need to worry about transference, potential transference with a topical gel to a child or to an intimate partner. Uh, with an injectable, we don't need to worry about that. Okay. Um, and is there ever a role for varicoselectomy to correct uh, levels of testosterone? So this, this is a, an interesting concept, right? So we know that varicoceles, first of all, we know varicoceles are very common. One in five men have varicoceles, so they're highly prevalent. 
And we know that it's indisputable that varicocytes can potentially impact sperm production. No, no question about that. This issue about varicocytes also impacting, you know, testicular endocrine function and, and paracrine function is, is another matter. And so, um, so, you know, there have been some studies that have been done that have shown, you know, after varicocytes correction, the testosterone levels go up. But I would say at this point in time, it's a little bit murky. I think the data is a little bit murky. And the real question would be, you know, who do you, who do you offer varicocytectomy to? Are you gonna really offer it to all men prophylactically of varicocytes? I don't think so. Um, what about waiting until a man reaches a point where he has low testosterone? Would you fix the varicocyte then? Well, you know, at that point, maybe he's got enough atrophy and permanent damage that he won't respond. So I think that, you know, these matters need to be addressed in a, in a thoughtful way. We do find patients requesting uh, this surgery to, or procedure to correct a varicocele, but really the, the jury's still out in terms of the data. There's data out there, but it's, it's, you know, there's not an abundance of it and it's not methodologically, you know, optimized data. Okay, um, moving on to some infertility related questions. Uh, for patients that have azospermia on testosterone replacement therapy um, and wish to conceive, how do you counsel and treat these patients? Um, what are their chances of uh, conceiving? Yeah, so we see this all the time. So in my mind, I think the longer someone's been on testosterone therapy and the higher the dosage that, dosages that someone's been on, the more that's gonna be an issue getting them back. But even with that in mind, majority of men, once we stop exogenous testosterone, will recover by about six months, even, some even sooner than that, but about six months. Remember the HPG axis needs to sort of um, wake up. But we don't kind of sit on our hands with these patients though, for a number of reasons. Number one, you know, they're gonna be symptomatic once you pull away their testosterone. So commonly we'll initiate therapy with one of those alternative agents that we talked about. Uh, commonly, you know, a serum such as clomiphene citrate, uh, and or HCG and or an aromatase inhibitor. So usually we'll start those when we stop the testosterone because very often once you stop the testosterone, these guys will start, some of them will start to feel um, you know, crummy in terms of their symptoms. And then we check semen testing three months later. We wanna wait three months because that's how long a cycle of sperm production takes. And then at three month intervals. And the good news is that even up to two years out, it can take that long for some guys to recover sperm production. But it's a small minority that won't ultimately, you know, get sperm back in the ejaculate. Okay. And um, two questions here. Do you ever begin Clomid on those patients? Um, and once they've conceived, if they know they want to have a second child, uh, do you worry about them going back on testosterone replacement therapy and then stopping again when they're ready to conceive again? Yeah. So, um, yeah, absolutely. So, we, you know, the three alternative agents, Clomiphene, Citrate, which is a CIRM, aromatase inhibitors, um, um, you know, these are, these are agents that we'll use along with, uh, so HCG, Clomid, and, and aromatase inhibitors. Definitely use those either alone or in combination in these men who've been on testosterone uh, and we want to stop and help them have a child. So it's interesting, the patients can be maintained over the long term, and again, use of these three agents, I want to stress, it was in the slide, but this is an off-label fashion typically for these men, but that doesn't mean it's wrong or improper, it just means that these agents haven't been put through the FDA, you know, um, approval process for these indications. So, you know, if someone has a child and then they want to go back on testosterone therapy, you know, sometimes we'll just have them go back on testosterone and then three to six months before they want to try to conceive, have them come off testosterone and go back on one of these alternative agents. You know, there's some literature out there about using concurrent HCG in a low dose with exogenous testosterone to help support intratesticular testosterone production. And we have some patients on that. Um, you know, there are a handful of studies out there that, you know, discuss use of these. Uh, you know, in terms of the, the, the guidelines, there really wasn't enough data out there to talk about that specifically. But I think that some of us are, are using that approach in a thoughtful way with patients. Okay. Uh, two follow-up questions regarding what you just answered. Do you monitor um, uh, the H and H differently for these patients on the combination therapies, um, and what type of aromatase inhibitor do you prescribe? 
Yeah, so in terms of monitoring the H and H, so, um, you know, unless there's some sign that, you know, that they're at, at risk for increased H and H, we really don't do anything differently. We're bringing them back every six months um, in, in assessment, so pretty close follow up. And, um, you know, in terms of aromatase inhibitors, um, you know, typically a, a nasterazole would be the, the one that's um, available and, and commonly used. Okay. Um, and for prostate cancer screening for men studying uh, testosterone replacement therapy uh, over age 40, um, how frequently do you uh, monitor their PSA in your practice? So we're, again, we're bringing them back every six months. And so we'll check a PSA and digital rectal exam at those, at those frequencies. Okay. Um, and I think we have time for one last question. Do you ever prescribe intranasal testosterone? So intranasal testosterone is a newer formulation that's available. And I would just say that, um, you know, there's uh, some literature out there suggesting that it may actually, uh, you know, patients on this therapy may have maintenance of the HPG axis and maintenance of spermatogenesis. Uh, there's some literature, wanna continue to see more literature on that. Uh, I think it's, it's an option like all these are options. At the end of the day, you know, what it boils down to for an individual patient is us as doctors sitting down and looking at the menu of options and, and really going through the pros and cons of each, each therapeutic option and then picking the one that's best for that patient. But, you know, it's FDA approved, it's, it's, it's out there and available and certainly um, should be considered amongst the mix of therapeutic options. All right. Well, I think we're, we're out of time. Thank you so much, Dr. Brennan. And we got a lot of great questions, um, some that we weren't able to address, so we'll post them online. Um, I just want to remind everybody to fill out the surveys. Um, thank you again, Dr. Brennigan. We'll, we'll see you all uh, next week. If I could just thank you all. You know, good luck to all of you. Stay safe and healthy and uh, look forward to seeing you down the road. Take care. Thank you. Bye. Bye.